Okay. I'm going to start with two verses. I think everyone knows like the back of the hand. It's Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, well, there's, there's two words that stand out to me in, in verse 2. The first one is transformed, which in Greek is metamorpho, uh, which also means changed in form. And the other word that stood out to me was prove that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that is dokimazo, which can also be translated as interpret. So if I paraphrase verse 2, it reads, Do not be conformed to this world, but be changed in form by the renewing of your mind, that you may interpret what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So what's also interesting about this word transformed is it can also be translated into the word transfigured. So if transformation also means being transfigured, like on the Mount of Transfiguration, where their appearance was changed, that's what happens to us in the spirit. Because our spirit is in communion with the Holy Spirit. The more we change, the more we transform our way of thinking, the more we are transfigured into the likeness of Christ. And this is our ticket into heaven. This is our ticket to the closeness um, of God. Because it determines how close we are going to be of, to God by how much we look like him, how much we think like him, like him how much we are like him. It's going to determine whether we're out court Christians, inner court Christians, or in the Holy of Holies. So the changing of our minds has a far greater effect than perhaps we realize. There's no wonder Satan, our enemy, goes out of his way to stop this transformation of the mind. He doesn't want us becoming in the likeness of Christ. Um, so that's what he loves to attack more than anything, is the mind, by giving us thoughts, images into our mind and imagination. Um, so we don't think we can change, so we don't think we're any good, so we don't think anything's happening. Uh, but it's actually what he wants to stop happening the most. He, he wants to get to you. He wants to stop that transfiguration. He wants to stop that change in form. So, right. So, the closer we get to God, the more transformed we are. As we get closer to God, the more of his words we can interpret. The more we can interpret his messages, his scripture, his dreams, his visions... Um, the more we can change into his likeness. The world is Satan's, I think we all know that. Um, and he's doing everything, everything he can to get the world's thinking as far away from God's word as possible. There's now so much distraction and confusion because so much is going on. The world is full of argument, not harmony. It's full of selfish ambition and pride. It's deception and lies are everywhere. It's all about cleaning the outside of the cup. Um, Matthew 24 warns us, there's, and we can see this happening in the world now. I know this is something that's been spoke about recently, but there'll be wars and ruin of, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, false prophets, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So we're not going to be untouched by these things. We're not going to be unaffected by them. Um, so what do we do? Well, I'm going to read out of Numbers 21, starting at verse 4. And this is where Moses is leading the Israelites through the wilderness. And he says, Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea 
to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our soul loathes this worthless bread. This worthless bread is the manna from heaven. That is, that, that is quite astonishes me that the worthless bread is the manna from heaven. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. This is a, a brilliant example of how we need to focus, of how we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. This is an example of ignoring the distractions of the world huge distraction this one but whether they hurt or not whether the big distractions or small ones we've still got to keep our eyes on him we've got to focus on what god has told us to focus on you know the the modern world it's full of full of distractions um huge small medium distractions and i guess the the easiest one and the most obvious distraction to pick on is tv you know it's uh so much so that people refer to watching loads of TV as vegging out, don't they? Literally sitting there like a vegetable. Um, you won't be any worse off if you were put to sleep during this time that you watch TV. You'd probably be better off. <laughs> the kind of putting to sleep where you wake up. <laughs> but the truth is we've got generations now being put to sleep. You know, they're just, they're dormant, they're not awake, they're not listening, they're just living their own lives, they're just focusing on themselves. Um, and I read First Principles by Neville Johnson, and it's quite wonderful. And Neville Johnson said, the only hope for the people of this world is them being able to see Christ in us. That's, that's quite a responsibility. Because what else is going to snap them out of it? Um, and he's talking about a people who have given up their lives. A people who Christ is so enlarged in that they can speak directly into these people's lives. A people who have been transfigured. A people who won't bow down to this world, but act in complete love, in kindness, gentleness, but will not compromise so we all know biblically what a sword represents it's the word of God have you actually seen a sword being made you know they, they melt the metal they pour it into a mold and then when that um, when it's cooled enough they pick up the sword and they put it into the fire then they take it out and they hammer it and they put it into the fire well, what putting it into the fire does is it brings all the impurities to the surface. And then when they hammer it, all the impurities are knocked off. And they do this for days. However strong they want that sword to be is how long they put it back into the fire and hammer it for. Well, this is what the Word of God does to us. It brings our impurities to the surface. And um, something I wondered about is Matthew 15, 21. Uh, but these are the, the words of God directly from his mouth. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered and not a word. 
And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, <coughs> Excuse me, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. What I wondered was, why did Jesus refer to her as a dog? That, that seems a little harsh, doesn't it? Straight, doesn't know her first, you know, not met before, referring to her as a dog. And the reason I wonder about this is because I wonder if this woman referred to Jews as dogs. So she was actually prejudiced, racist, anti-Semitic. Um, however, when she acknowledged this and humbled herself, I think more than her daughter was delivered. I think she was delivered from this wrong attitude, this prejudice, Maybe it was even a wrong spirit. But what I have found with the Lord is there's always more going on than you think there is. He always does more than you think he's doing. So, um, as we read the Bible, the Bible reads us. You know, Romans 7.7. 7. I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not cover. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so I would not, uh, you shall not cover. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. So like uh, I mentioned, it's, it's the refining fire of God's word that brings the impurities to the surface. As soon as you find out you shouldn't be doing something, how much more do you want to do it? Um, and it's our responsibility to knock them off. We've got to do the work. We've got to, we've got to do the change. And as the woman from Canaan showed us, as the Lord does his work in us, we need to be thankful and we need to be humble enough um, to acknowledge the changes we need to make. So let's praise him even when it doesn't suit us because that is part of the change that is part of the refining fire you know when we look at the great men and women of god those that have had visitation after visitation experience after experience um they have this because they went after him and when you look at the, how long they went after him for you know, months and more often than not, years. Uh, years. That altered the lives to fit around this pursuit. They, um, they persevered. They waited. They were patient. They didn't stop. Um, again, Neville, one of Neville Johnson's mentors, uh, is it Walter Bueller? Butler. Yeah, right, Butler. Um, he used to get up in the middle of the night or the middle of the morning I don't know if it was one or two o'clock in the morning and he'd get up I think it was for an hour every single night and he'd wait on the Lord and he persevered he was patient he didn't stop and after a year Jesus walked in the room and, you know, I used to think how blessed these people are. <coughs> now I think, look how much more they tried. Look how much more they put in. Look how much more they went after him. Look how much more they determined they were. The focus, they wouldn't take the focus off him. This was daily. He did this. Excuse me. All right, so the world is in trouble now because it's not followed God's word. 
So like the Israelites in the wilderness, they didn't remove from their lives what they should have done. The trials didn't change them. Um, they didn't respond and they didn't try to change their ways. And, you know, whether you've been given a mighty role in this life or not, it doesn't matter. This, this is why. So, the first king of Israel was a man who thought nothing of himself. And because of that, God promoted that attitude. But Saul didn't follow God's word. He had Samuel, the bona fide prophet of God, telling him what to do, and he did it his way instead. So he fell. Now let's look at Enoch. There's no reported influence in his time. There's no miracles. There's no crowds listening to him. There's no reports of any evangelism. There's no fame. But look at the legacy of his faith. We still talk about him now. We still wonder about him now. What did he do to please God so much? He lived for him. And I, I don't know who said it, but it certainly stuck in my mind. Um, I've heard it said that Enoch was so full of the Lord that he wouldn't have died. So God had to take him. So, to look from a worldly perspective at these two, at Saul and Enoch, it could be argued Saul had the mightier role. He was king of Israel. Who would you rather be like? Saul or Enoch? Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego didn't know they were going to be saved from the furnace. Which out of spite was heated up seven times its usual temperature. Now there was no need to heat it up seven times. It had killed them anyway. But the psychological pressure, the, the just plain nastiness to put the extra terror on them. Uh, Daniel didn't know. He would walk out the lion's den unharmed. So the snakes around their feet here of fear and terror. But these four godly men trusted God more than, so they weren't going to give in to, to fear at all. So let's, so let's not focus on the snakes around our feet, even when we get bitten, because the answer is always the same. Keep your eyes on him. Let's not weigh things up by the standards of the world. It's the knowledge and closeness to God where all the answers and questions lie. In 2 Peter 1, verse 3, and I, read, I like the way the, I think it was Julie that told me to look this up in the Passion Translation. And it says, Everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. For all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. It's all about knowing him. It's all about being in relationship with him. Um, the last time I've spoke, spoken about an event in Moses, and... Um, there's one thing that stood out to me, so I'm just going to read through it again. It's number 16, verses 41 to 50. Numbers 16, verses 41 to 50. This is where Moses, yet again, intercedes for the Israelites. Just wait for you to find it. All right. On the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened, when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned towards the tabernacle of meeting, and suddenly the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from among this congregation, 
that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. So Moses said to Aaron, take a censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague had begun. Then Aaron took it as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the assembly and already the plague had begun among the people. So he put in the incense so he put in the incense and made atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the Korah incident. So Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting for the plague had stopped. Excuse me. Now God told Moses, get away from among this congregation. Now Moses had just seen the visible presence of the Lord cover the tabernacle. And yet, Moses appears to go against what God is doing. Why? God's just told him, get away from this congregation. He's going to destroy them. He's seen the visible. Why does he go against what God says? It's because he knows God. He knows his heart. He was in relationship. He was close to God. And that's how he knew it was okay. It's literally the key to everything. It's knowing God. It's knowing his heart. It's all about changing and being transfigured to be more like him so we can understand what God wants. All right, so now I'm going to read from 1 Samuel 24. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told to him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheep's folds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. Now David knew God's word. This is from Exodus 22, verse 28. You shall not revile God, nor curse a ruler of your people. And God called David a man after his own heart. David respected God's words. You know, he was quick to repent. When you read David's Psalms, you can see how much he adored the Lord, how much he loved him. And that adoration really shines through. And also, David acted in faith all the time. His faith was unshakable in God. You know, when we... Let's look at Goliath. Um, and what David said to Goliath just before they th fought... I thought, you know, this, this is amazing. So this is 1 Samuel 17, verses 45 to 47. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, 
I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now that's faith. Imagine standing in front of someone who's nine foot tall with armor on. No, all these men behind him wouldn't take him on. And how old is he? 16? Something like that. 16 year old boy. I love you. That's what David was saying. But he trusted in God. It was a, Samuel had anointed him. That's what he trusted in. He trusted in God more than the fear of fighting this man. So, as we grow in the knowledge of God, our faith matures through relationship. As we grow in God, he grows in us. But we've got to put the work in. This isn't a free ride. We, we've got to labor to enter into rest. And just to mention a few things we need to be doing, right? we've got to be reading his word daily. We've got to be meditating on it. We've got to be asking for revelation. So when you're reading and something doesn't seem to sink in, stop, research it, meditate on it, think about it. Don't just breeze past it. Ask for revelation. We need to be praying daily. We need to be having self-examination daily. You know, I kind of like self-examination to, to like weeding in a garden. Weeding, yes. Um, we need to be searching for grudges, bitterness, unforgiveness, asking to the Lord to, to reveal to us what we don't realize, what, what must go, what the, what the little nicks in the shaft that are going to stop us flying straight. Um, because, like, for example, when you're weeding, you, you can't just pull out the bit you can see. It's going to grow back. You've got to dig down. You've got to get the roots out. And the longer you leave it, the harder it is to remove. So, yeah. So the root of all bad things in this world is within. In our, it's in our hearts. The root of all bad things. So if we, remo if we remove it from within, the problem just doesn't exist anymore. Other things we've got to do, we've got to be waiting on the Lord. We've got to be seeking his face. We've got to be exercising and practicing our imagination. We've got to be learning to interpret the dreams and visions. We've got to be praising and worshiping him. And fellowship, we've got to be in fellowship. So it's not that difficult to see why we need to labor to enter into rest. It's not difficult to see why you've got to alter your life to put him first. Um, yeah, so, but what we get in return is far greater. We get hidden. So as we come more and more out of the world and know God better, discerning some things comes easier, some things. Differences will stand out, especially as we keep the company of those that we're in fellowship with. So I'm going to read now from Matthew 7. Verses 15 to 20. Just give you a moment to find it. All right. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So what are the fruits? 
Well, Galatians 5.22 tells us the fruits, the fruits of the Spirit. So the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if we recognize people by their fruits, then we should be looking at things like what makes them happy. So if someone sees someone getting publicly embarrassed, and that makes them happy. When they see someone make a fool of themselves, when that makes them happy. Um, when they get one up on someone, are they happy by that? What makes them joyful? Seeing someone they hate getting beaten up. Um, when are they only kind and gentle? Is it when they get something out of it? From what spirit is that fruit from? Because it's not the Holy Spirit. That's how we recognize them, by their fruits. So when we see someone whose happiness comes from helping someone, especially with no gain for themselves, then we know that's the good tree. So we're going to need discernment like we've never needed it before because there are so many disguises now. Like I mentioned earlier, the world is now about cleaning the outside of the cup. It's about appearing good, looking good, sounding good. Um, so we're going to need discernment like we've never needed it before. Um, you know, Matthew 24 says, uh, 24, 24 says, the false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And we're going to need, we're going to need closeness to God. This, this, I can't see any other way. Um, so what do we do about the false prophets that don't show great signs? You know, Jeremiah, Jeremiah warns us of this in Jeremiah 23, verses 16 to 17. This is what the Lord of heaven, heaven's armies says to his people. Now you notice this is the Lord talking to his people. This is the relationship we need. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says to his people. Do not listen to these prophets when they prophesy to you, filling you with futile hopes. They are making up everything they say. They do not speak for the Lord. They keep saying, saying to those who despise my word. So they're ignoring God's word as well. They're saying what they want and they're ignoring God's word. Don't worry, right, sorry. They, uh, they keep saying to those who despise my word, don't worry. The Lord says you will have peace. And to those who stubbornly follow their own desires, they say no harm will come your way. Those who stubbornly follow their own desires, no harm will come their way. Well, we're seeing this all the time in the world now, in the church, where they're trying to be popular uh, with ideas that are not Christian, that don't line up with Scripture. So, and, and they'll often say, well, God is love. And they use this as an excuse, a way out to excuse anything they're doing. And all they do is they show that they don't know God at all. They don't know his word. They're not in relationship. They're not in communion with him. Um, and that's why they need, uh, this world needs a group of people, a remnant that they can see Christ in. So it all seems very concerning to me, um, the, ne the necessity for discernment. Um, and the only way around this is to be able to have a two-way conversation with God yourself. Because um, your own personal relationship, um, I, I can't see any other way. How, how else are we, are we going to be able to discern these things for ourselves? Um, so, Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. And Passover shows us that we are only live, delivered from sin and death by sacrifice. Jesus delivered us from sin, 
But in order for us to avoid living in sin, we must also become a sacrifice, a sacrificed life. The only way to keep up a sacrificed life is to live a sanctified one. Jesus gave up his life as the final blood sacrifice. He came to show us how to receive the promises of the Father. He came to show us how we overcome the world. He came to show us to live by the Spirit is, is to self-determine what you think about. He came to show us to self-determine, to focus your mind. He came to teach us to self-determine the condition of your heart. He came to save us. You know, I thought the Old Testament and the New Testament, I used to sit asking the Lord, why the two different ways? They're not two different ways. The New Testament is more help. It fulfilled the Old Testament. It's not two different ways, it's more help. His crucifixion was the greatest exorcism the world's ever seen. He protected us by giving us back the authority we had handed over to darkness when Adam sinned. He put darkness on a shorter leash by giving us the power of his name. And when he died on that cross, battered, raw, mocked, spat on, what was God's response? To tear the veil. Then he gave us the Holy Spirit. He showed us how much we are loved and the inclusiveness of that love, the power of forgiveness and the freedom in repentance. In, um, in John 3, verse 3, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. These two words, born again, can also be translated as born from above. So this is the start of a new life. It means to be born anew. So, in closing, I'd like to leave you with two Bible verses. The first one is Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Do you believe? We've got to believe this. We've got to believe in that. It's so simple, and it's completely true. And the other one is James 1, verses 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that, so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, thank you for listening. Hold down the... So thank you, Stephen, for that word that you brought to us today. Um, and uh, just remains for me to say uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, uh, all those on Zoom and, uh, and on YouTube. Um, it's been a pleasure to all be together today. And so we uh, just pray now that God will bless and empower us all to live according to the will 
and purposes of our God and King. God bless you all. Okay. Bye.